I'm going to introduce our speaker today. He's coming to us actually from Budapest, Hungary. So uh, David Mahali, David's a development economist focused on the impact of natural resource wealth on public finances. So he spent the last decade studying advising, providing training on these issues across countries in Africa. Um, he recently has joined the World Bank and uh, that will be where he'll be moving to. So the talk that he's giving is actually from um, uh, chapter two, a paper that is in the AABG memoir 125, Giant Fields of the Decade 2010 to 2020. Um, so I really look forward to hearing him talk about the data and statistics that he's going to show on the economic importance of giant oil and gas discoveries, which I think is timely given that ExxonMobil, Hess, and Nexon just announced three more discoveries in offshore Guyana, bringing that resource up to about 11 billion barrels. And this is from a country that went from having no, no oil and gas resources to 11 billion barrels uh, in a matter of about six, six seven years. So that, that's pretty outstanding. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to turn it over to David to start sharing his screen and off we go. Hi, everyone. Um, really happy to, to be joining uh, and talking with you. I've been, I'm an economist by training and mainly been talking to economists. Very rarely have the occasion and privilege to talk to, to geologists who actually know what they're talking about when, when we talk of, when we economists talk of resource wealth and uh, well discoveries and, and all that. So, um, yeah, I look forward to what is a very exciting conversation to me. Um, so this uh, this is uh, as mentioned a, 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 a paper that we did uh, for the AP, APG memoir, uh, and it's basically summarizing some of the research, the economic research uh, on the impact of oil and gas discoveries. Uh, that's that's what we uh, we wrote. Uh, that's what we wrote that chapter on, and it's building on our on some of our own work, but also other other scholars in in, in the field. So um, I'm now. Uh, this, this paper and this research agenda is part of, of, of uh, my, my research that I do at the Keele Institute, uh, where I'm a PhD candidate, but I'm also an economist at the World Bank. But everything I say is not, not World Bank uh, opinion or, or World Bank affiliate. Uh, it doesn't represent the World Bank's opinion or anything like that. Uh, the, the paper is actually co-authored with, with uh, other colleagues also at the World Bank, James Cust and Alexis Rivera Ballesteros. Okay, with that, let me go to the next slide if I can. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is this is uh, this study is part of of, of the AP, AAPG memoir, the latest one on, on giant discoveries, uh, and I'm going to talk mainly about why we economists care about these discoveries. So I'm going to try to run through some of the key papers that discuss some of the, these economic impacts. Then I'm going to give you a very, very brief preview of what we called uh, with, with, uh, with my co-authors, we called the pre-source guys uh, through a case study. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some, some of my latest work, which is about getting giant discoveries or any discoveries really out of the ground. Uh, okay, so the resource guys, I'm sure many of you, you know, this is economics textbook for us, but I'm sure as, as geologists working on in the sector, you, you came across uh, the phenomenon of the resource curse, this idea that countries that are rich in natural resources might be doomed to develop more slowly or, or, or stay poor. Uh, this hypothesis has been around for a long, long time, going back to the idea that, you know, the Spanish failed to industrialize because all, all the gold inflow that they had uh, from uh, from the conquests uh, in the in the fifteen and uh, 1500s. but it was more formally set out by uh, Jeffrey Sachs and, and Michael Warner in a in a paper in 1995, which basically found this correlation negative correlation where countries that are rich in and very dependent on uh, fuel or and metals exports so resource exports. That's on the on the x-axis on the graph. The countries that are most dependent, like Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, 
Zambia at the time. This, is, this was measured in 1970. Are the countries that experience, experience the lower level of growth than the countries that were not uh, reliant on these primary exports, basically? So that was, that was this uh, sort of basic paper uh, that we all learn in, in, uh, in textbooks. Uh, this has since been you know, disputed a lot. There's, it's a disputable comparison when you look at countries that, you know, uh, that are very different. Uh, rich and poor, geographically, all sorts. It's also very, very long time horizons, right? This paper goes back to 1970. Some papers go further, even further back. And we don't learn a ton from comparing, from looking at these, these very long arcs uh, across very different countries, especially in terms of the policy lessons. Yes, don't, don't be Nigeria, but what does it mean, don't be Nigeria? Uh, or don't be Congo. Is there is there anything actionable in terms of what what is one country doing right or one country doing wrong? Uh, and and you know over 30, 40 year horizons, it's very very hard to discern uh, patterns, obvious patterns of policy. Obviously, you can make assertions around culture and, and, and sort of deeper things, but in terms of uh, policy choices that these countries made, it's very hard to capture any of that in in that kind of time horizon. Uh, there's a new strand of research, and that's that's what we got us excited. What's not that's not trying to compare resource rich and resource poor countries. Rather, it's looking at countries immediately or soon after they make a big discovery. So you can look at the country before the discovery or after the discovery. You can look at countries that are very similar, just around the same years. And it's it's a bit of a economist like uh, think of it as a cleaner comparison to to use uh, what they call sometimes called difference in difference where you look at the trends of, of a bunch of country and one of them makes a discovery, say, in a particular year, and then you can sort of keep continuing to compare for a couple of years, whether the trend from, of the country that made a discovery differs from, from, from its peer group, basically. So what happens to these countries after they find these huge oil de deposits? The first big paper of this type is, is quite recent. It's, it's, uh, it was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is the most prestigious journal of our field by uh, Rabah, Reski, and, and co-authors. Uh, and it finds that, you know, these are, that you can basically very clearly see the impacts of these discoveries in the macro, in the economic data. You see GDP jumps uh, five years after the, fi the discovery is found. That's what you see on the right side. You see consumption doesn't move that much, and you see a negative effect on employment after the discovery. Uh, and then they do a lot more of these kind of analyses. I'm just showing you as an example that, uh, of, of how you can use uh, exactly the, the moment, the timing of this discovery, and look at how it impacts these, these macroeconomic variables. Uh, I'm going to give you more examples of this sort in a, in a minute. But the big question is how do we, so how do we use this discovery data? Well, the main way we use this discovery data is we just don't just look at the event itself. We also look at the size of the event. And, we, and to calculate the size of the event, we do what's called, uh, what we call net present value calculations, where we take the, uh, well, we take the uh, estimate, estimated ultimately recoverable reserves, which I know is a, debatable concept and, and all that, but we take whatever numbers uh, we found in the, in, the, in the giant discovery data sets uh, in terms of uh, recoverable uh, resource, reserves, uh, or recoverable resources, sorry, I'm getting confused already, and URR, and, uh, and, and then take the price at the moment of the discovery and then do a calculation in terms of, you know, maybe it takes 30 years or we take sort of an average curve. Well, this is what the RSK paper did. It take the average curve in terms of how many years it might take to extract that oil and sort of calculates the value, the value of that flow, the value of that money flow. Obviously, it's going to be very imprecise, but the idea is, is that a, a discovery you know, 500 million barrels is different for Guyana than it is for the United States, 
right? And to get those numbers into perspective, we calculate it as a percentage GDP, which is, again, is an imprecise measure of the size of the economy of the country. But it gets to the idea that, you know, this same giant discovery might mean very different thing for one country than another country. Uh, and it puts basically a dollar value and then a percentage GDP value to that discovery. And so we did that. You can, we looked at it across regions. And one interesting thing you see in the data is that if you just look at the, 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 the count of discoveries and where they happen, we see that a quarter of them happens in the, in the Middle East and, uh, and North Africa region, for example. Uh, we see that in terms of uh, their total value, as is in the, in their, uh, their total value uh, uh, is, is the largest, again, in the Middle Eastern region. And then you see their values as, as well as percentage GDP. And again, Middle East will come out first, but you also see that, for example, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, SSA, it has a relatively low count of discoveries and a relatively low value in terms of, of, of the value of the discoveries in, uh, in billion dollars. But as percentage GDP, it's, it's rather significant. 35% uh, of, of the continent's GDP, based on this estimate, was found uh, in, this, in terms of discoveries. Uh, throughout the 1950 to 2017 period, that, or period, that's the period we, we've been using because GDP data is very unreliable before 1950, basically, and the countries were not the same uh, in many cases. So this is this is discoveries by decades, and there you see that actually Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and Latin America are are actually increasing in in trends in terms of the number of discoveries we just mentioned, Guyana. Uh, making record numbers of, of giant discoveries and, and in terms of size as well. But even more interesting for us is not the absolute number of discoveries, as I said, but the value for the host economy. So in terms of billions of barrels, again, you see Kuwait, Russia, saw these on the left side as the big discoveries. This is, it's not a linear scale, it's a log scale. But again, you see these hundred uh, uh, billions of barrels found, so this is the, the largest discoveries in the, in the giant discovery data set, uh, and these mega giants uh, fields and all that. And, uh, and again, most of the biggest discoveries happen in the, happen in the Middle East. In, in the, uh, but then you look at these values in terms of a country's share of the share of the country's economy, and then you get very different countries that are sort of that made very big discoveries. So for example, you see the Guyana one we just mentioned, this is the first LISA discovery that we have there because the latest ones weren't included in the, in the data set yet. As, as, uh, um, and then, but you also see uh, the Sierra Leone's Venus one discovery, uh, Congo, Trinidad, uh, have made very, very significant discoveries in terms of countries own GDP. Um, so we have this measure, right? For us, this is what matters the most. We have these measures of discoveries in terms of the size, as measured in the size of the country's economy uh, in net present value terms. And that type of measure has been applied and used in over 20 social science papers that all use this. Let's look at where, where there have been the biggest sort of discovery shocks for the economy and what impact did it have on various social indicators. And these 20 papers I mentioned, the Areski et al. Uh, QGE paper from 2017, which was looking at, which found, which was the first big one and saw these big jumps in GDP five years after discovery, but also investment growth, and, 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 but also declines in employment. Uh, but then we saw uh, there, was, there was actually an earlier paper that made less waves that was looking at long-term patterns. Uh, decades after the production, uh, to be fair. Uh, but then there's other papers that look at uh, investment spike in other sectors by uh, Toebs and Bazina. Uh, there's a paper by Rizante and Sobrino that's focused on, on the borrowing boom that happens immediately after the discovery, which is quite similar to our own paper, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, which looks at, at the short-term impacts of these discoveries. Some other papers that are out there, just to mention briefly, the giant discoveries are associated with, more mil with an increase in military spending, more conflicts, less taxation, less patents, so less innovation, basically, more protectionist trade policies, 
rulers staying in power for longer if, if they happen to have a discovery um, while they're in power. So the pre-source curse hypothesis that we put forward with, with my co-author uh, was the idea the countries, some countries in, in countries with, and we were focused on, on what we call countries with weak institutions. So these are often countries uh, that that's sort of the lowest level of human capital and then the less rely and then the worst performance on various metrics of of uh, of rule of law and, uh, and other measures of that nature they what we found is soon after giant discoveries they have they have a big short there's there's a there's a big optimism in terms of their expected growth trajectory as measured by IMF forecasts and what we found is that these countries signif always was systematically fall short of the expected boom that that you know the IMF was projecting in these countries. And one case study of that is, is the Mozambique discoveries in, in 2010 and 2011, uh, where the initial plan was to produce gas uh, from 2016, mainly via, uh, well, via LNG export, mainly onshore. Uh, and then two years after, there was a big scandal where uh, the government borrowed in secret. Uh, this was not authorized by parliament. They provided state guarantees to, to a state-owned company to, to purchase, to buy what was you know, deemed fishing and surveillance boats, $2 billion. Uh, there's now court cases uh, and, uh, and, um, and actually uh, even verdicts uh, against the banks that were involved and then the borrowers that were involved. Anyways, so that's that's on the corruption side of things, but also it meant that, uh, but there was also the fact that the gas projects phase C were delayed, not, I mean, partly because of the falling gas pricing, but also part because how the hidden debt scandal unraveled, uh, which meant that donors pulled out, the country defaulted on, 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 on repaying its own loans. And so these macroeconomic problems created further uncertainty uh, as well as there was insert, and now, well, a bit later, there was also insurgency in the gas region. So basically, only one, the smallest one, the FLNG, is, 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 has secured FID. Uh, the other, the bigger projects are, are still stalled. And, and the Mozambique story is, you know, Mozambique was, was actually, you know, projected to grow very, very rapidly and on, on the back of the growth, on the back of these, these gas discoveries. And to date, obviously, the country has become poorer in, in nominal terms than, than it was before it found the gas. So that's the kind of uh, problem that, that we, we highlight and, and analyze more systematically in, in our paper on the pre-source curse. We like to call it the pre-source curse because it happens before the actual resource curse comes in, right? At the moment of discovery and way before you become really dependent on the oil and gas revenues. That's the idea. Another problem that I'm, I'm focusing in my new research right now, which is still in, in very draft form, uh, we have a working paper out, or I have a working paper out, is whether is what take what it takes for countries to get discoveries out of the ground. Obviously, the Mozambique case is also one of those where a big part of the problem is the country is still not producing the gas, uh, and it didn't even reach final investment decision on the on the bigger projects. So I studied the number of years it takes between discovery to approval stage to startup stage. I've used both the giant discoveries data set initially uh, by APG uh, and, uh, and a full sample of discoveries by Rystad's UQ platform. Uh, and I can see for all of these discoveries, uh, actually, I'm Sorry, this is for, this is this whole, whole analysis is based on on the Rystad data because that's the one that gives me approval dates and startup dates on a, on a standardized form. But I'm looking at both all discoveries and discoveries that are beyond 500 million barrels. Uh, and what I see in the data is most discoveries that reach production they come online within four years, or for the giant discoveries it takes about six years to, for for the ones that came online to come online. But there's a long tail of discoveries that never reach production or, or that take a long, long time. So most discoveries, again, as I said, very relatively rapid. So close to the five years that, uh, that was actually put forward in the, in the RSQ paper as the average time it takes to get giant discoveries out of the ground. But 
actually, you know, if you include all the discoveries that never got to production, then that, that, are, that median value is actually more like, for giants, more like 80 years. And if you, uh, you know, if you include all the discoveries that are still not producing with a 20, 20 year, you get these, you get these discoveries that have been underground for 40, 50, 60 years uh, in, in some instances. I mean, obviously these are more, these are re relatively rare, uh, but it's not uncommon to have 10, 20 uh, years in the ground. And so I looked at the split by region, and then I do more statistical analysis where I control for the size of the discovery, whether it's onshore or offshore, whether it's oil or gas, whether it's how deep it is, and I add all various controls and the patterns stay relatively similar. I don't wanna dump very complicated statistical models into, into this discussion, but, I'm, uh, but I do wanna sort of highlight the key takeaway, which I, again is, is very obvious in the patterns is these countries with weaker institutional scores, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa have these very, very long timelines. So, you know, in North America, especially it's very, uh, not just the shale, but also the, the, the sort of regular oil is very quick to get out of the ground. Uh, I've actually excluded shale from, from a lot of the analysis. Uh, whereas, as I said, Sub-Saharan Africa, but not only Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm not, I'm not wanting to single them out. A lot of countries with weaker institutional capacities, they have these very long timelines often, or if you will put it another way, very struggle to get final investment decision on their discoveries. And if they do even, it takes longer to get from the decision to, uh, to, to actual production, both for oil and especially for gas. Um, Okay, and then this is the final the sort of thought-provoking, I hope thought-provoking graph that I did, which looks at the total value of resources discovered. Again, this is not, so this is not proven reserves. This is resources discovered. And I've, uh, and I've divided, well, so I look at the total production uh, uh, as a share of, of, of what was found. And what I see is, that countries, richer countries, uh, countries uh, in, in the West, uh, Western Europe, and, and, and also the US have extracted a relatively large share of what they found in, in the past, since 1900. Uh, that's, that's how far the data goes. Uh, whereas again, Af uh, Africa, but also Guyana there, um, and Suriname, obviously, uh, those are very recent discoveries, but the African ones are, are you know, some of them are 10, 15, 10 years old discoveries. Uh, they've, they've barely, many of these countries have not even started the extraction process. Tanzania's gas, you can think of, uh, Mauritania and Senegal only, only reaching final investment decision recently. So I think I'm interested in by this research because there's, I mean, again, we can debate how quickly energy transition might happen, but if there's an impetus for energy transition, meaning that, and I think it's clear that we are finding a lot more oil, there's a lot more oil being discovered and how much oil is being used up. So, you know, the, uh, there's, there's more additional resources found than there is. Uh, and if, if there is an acceleration towards more, uh, less reliance on, on, on oil, then the question is, Will some of these countries be able to get it out of the ground, or will it will it be stuck and then sort of stranded on the ground? So that's 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 one way I think about this research on timeline. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, this, so this this was what I prepared, and I'm happy to answer questions. And but also more even more excited to hear some feedback on how it looks like sounds from a geologist perspective. David, thank you. I'll get you to stop sharing your screen. Done. Thank you. And I don't have any questions in the Q&A right now, but I got all kinds of questions in my head. Um, and since we're a smaller crowd, if um, people can also just raise their hand or type a question in the chat, if you have one for, for David. Um, this is fascinating to me. So, so one question that I didn't understand on your graph why the negative effect on employment? I mean, it seems like when, when you look at what a lot of companies go in and, and tout about 
making a major discovery in an area, it's it's the jobs it will bring, it's all of that. But your chart actually actually said something else, which I found very surprising, <laughs> that there was a negative corollary with, with employment. What do you think drives that? I think that's, uh, that's it's evidence of something economists like to call the Dutch disease, which is the idea that uh, when you find oil or when you start producing, especially, you get all of the dollar dollar inflows into the country, and that makes your currency appreciate, which means that your, your economy, your other sectors become less competitive because you got such amount of dollar inflow. Suddenly, your currency becomes uh, stronger, which means that if you're, say, a garment producer or whatnot, you, you're facing cheaper, it's going to be much cheaper to import things because everyone has dollars, basically, and it's going to be a lot harder to be to remain competitive for an exporter of whatever rice or whatever else. Oh. So that could be, so, so that's, that's one risk with the oil production. That's one of the ideas that's been put forward that the reason oil, oil rich countries are struggling in all their other sectors is because, you know, oil sector brings dollars, meaning other sectors become less competitive. And there is evidence that exchange rate movements happen already very soon after discovery as there's FDI, if there's like all the money that coming in. And yes, the oil sector does employ some people, but it's never, it's very rare in a country to have, you know, a big chunk of the population being employed in the oil sector, like a sizable one. Uh, that's, that's unless, you know, it's through midstream and, and, and through, right. but that, that happens a lot later than, than you would, um, so yeah, that yeah, would that, be the hypothesis. That was, that was very, very su surprising for me as well. And, um, another question I had was on your timeline chart, which I thought, cause I was about to ask before you showed it, do you have this broken out by region, which you did. Um, so when, when you look at that, because one of the challenges in oil and gas exploration is the fact that you know, until you actually get product out of the ground and it goes into either a pipeline, a boat, or or a product, you don't make any money, right? It's 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 negative. It's ma maximum cash impairment. And so, in some of these countries, it doesn't exactly it it it's almost a bipolar type thing. The countries that have a lot of remaining resources is where you want to go. But from your work and from your analysis, many of those countries are in places where it's an extremely long timeline to be able to ever get anything to market. So does your chart basically say, shift your focus to North America, which has less resource or Europe, because your odds of if you find something and getting something online sooner and making some money is going to be better. So it's, it, it's really a bit of a rock and a hard place with the data that you showed. I've I've not thought of it that way, but you're. I mean, I guess that's that's definitely one way uh, to to read read the charts. I was thinking more from a government policy perspective. The idea is these governments need to fix whatever the problems they face, right? I mean, it's I you know there's again this this is a golden opportunity now with the world sort of craving for gas. Uh, non-Russian gas, I would say, uh, and uh, and yes, and you know, there's all the there's all the gas in Tanzania and in, in Senegal and uh, other places, and it's just not not there yet, right? And but it was it was discovered a decade ago, uh, and and you know, countries uh, and there were you know, I remember all the all the all the controversies and negotiations in in, in Tanzania mm -hmm. uh, between the state state ownership, domestic utilization, all of these questions came up. And I'm not suggesting they're not important, but also there's, there's a risk that, you know, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the, the Indos, and, you know, Uganda finally secured a, a final investment decision like 12 years right. down the line. Again, it was those refinery and those, those questions were burning. Uh, so, so another way to read it is for policymakers to think through uh, you know where where those bottlenecks are coming from, and then and what what can be done about them. So Michael Hines has a question. Um, Michael, you can unmute if you'd like to ask a question yourself. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Michael Hines. Um, my question is: What can now be done to improve the much delayed 
African to bring the much delayed African resources to market. Thanks. So yeah. the next question. Yes, they are delayed, but what can be done going forward? I, I think that's, uh, I like, I'd say, my, make clear my research didn't really find like a magical. <laughs> magical trigger where uh, it seems to me one thing that I did find in data is actually domestic national companies seem to be more aggressive. So nationalizations seem to trigger faster timelines, uh, not as in so more national uh, national oil company ownership and, and, and hard operatorship and all that. So that's not necessarily a uh, so that, that, that may suggest two things. That may suggest that they are better at circumventing some of the administrative hoops and, and uh, uh, that could be one way or they're willing to take bigger financial risks uh, because they have deeper pockets because they know that the state is going to you know, support them. I don't know. So that's, that's definitely one thing uh, that, that the data suggested uh, is that you know, those with it, say, for example, within a country, the resources that had a larger... Uh, NOC participation, we're getting getting these, um, and you know most most of the, well, the US and and Canada and a few countries don't have national companies, but in most countries there is one. Um, so that's that's one part. I guess the second part is uh, is is the harder one, which is which is more about the types of institutional reforms and the, and the types of um, procedures that 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 should be in place. Um, I think maybe one thing that I'm particularly interested in is the whole sort of local use idea. It seems like a sticking point in many of the countries is that they they want to make sure that they don't not just they, they don't just get taxes, but they also get um, local content, local content or domestic utilization or other types of benefits. So I think that that would be an interesting question to research further but i've not not gone i can't find the data in a clean way which would tell me which which countries has how much of these these obligations in a, in a way that could use that uh, but i think that 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 might be one of the avenues uh, to look at yeah it, it definitely speaks to you know as geoscientists you know we we follow the rocks right so you know it's it's difficult at times when i would work with our commercial side our commercial guys would be like, well, why don't you guys just go to these places that have the best terms? It's like, well, having the best terms and that's only mean you have got to start with good rocks, good rocks and good source rock. And which is what is so sad about both Mozambique and Tanzania. And I've seen the data from both of the, from those discoveries, fantastic, beautiful rocks, fantastic resource, just challenging in a country that kind of can't get their act together. Um, to make it happen. And you had three majors in there trying to bring these resources to bear and, and you just couldn't get there. You know, they're in deep water, they're gas. So there's those challenges as well, but um, really, really tough, you know, and all the discoveries in the Romanian Black Sea were similar as well. Beautiful resource, but just very difficult to be able to, to bring forward. So it is a real challenge. So, you know, as a geoscientist, you know, we're like doctors without borders, right? It's rocks without borders. You just have to go where the best things are and then kind of hope for the best. But it, your data does bring up the challenge of, especially in the current environment, investment environment, if it's 10, 20 years to bring something online, that's really, really hard. So that comes back to the, do you think your data is showing you know, you need to do more with the resources you've got, like back to North America, where is it enhanced recovery? Is it, is it other things? Even though the U.S. isn't necessarily seen as a, as a really good, stable regulatory environment, because it changes a lot. Um, but at yeah. least you can get stuff going. It, it just points a really challenging picture and a challenging conversation with non-industry people. Well, you know, geologists follow the rocks. I mean, uh, my co-author Jim has uh, has another paper which which uh, which comes to mind where he looks at drilling, so exploration near mm -hmm. borders, and he finds that you know, like if he looks thirty kilometers left and right to the border, and what he finds is there's a lot more drilling happening in the country that has these better institutional and governance scores, right? So 
yeah, I guess from a geologist perspective, 30 kilometers is very little, but if it mix, means that you're on the other side of the Mexican, you know, US or the whatever border and you can choose the better regime in terms of whatever, what it could be, you know, institutional, anything, any of those those elements, then, you know, you see these patterns and there's the Uganda DRC line and there's a lot of these drillings that happen very close to, to these border areas. So, so uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, that's definitely part of the story there. And I guess part of the reason that so many, so many of these countries found so little actually is because no one really explored them, right? I mean, still Africa is way less explored in terms of the, the amount of exploration drilling that happened compared to, to um, you know, North America or whatever. There's an interesting chart you can pull up. So, so when you guys further your resource, if you also look at, because um, we had this chart for a while, the amount of seismic that's been shot, right? Because seismic is always our precursor to drilling. And you can pull up from public domain sources, essentially what the Africa continent um, it's more offshore than onshore. It's harder to pull up the onshore. But what that looked like in terms of seismic coverage in 2007 and what it looks like today, and it's incredible. There's very few parts of the Africa, and I mean, let's all the way around, right, that is not currently covered by at a minimum 2D and sometimes fairly dense 2D and a lot of 3D data. So sometimes the amount of drilling is done it's done is not a reflection of how good that country is. It's okay. Where's all the seismic been shot? And then if you look at that in relation to what countries think, because it's kind of scary when you go out there and you look at how much money has been spent. In fact, Joe Riley, when he does his talk um, at the end of May, he, he's going to talk about that. When you look at from the 2d to the 3d, and, and the rush now to find more stratigraphic traps around the globe, which started with the success in the Ivorian coast. And then now, of course, you know, Guyana is the, the golden child. There's a lot of money that's been spent on, on data. So yeah, it's, um, it's definitely going to follow up on, on the, on those charts. I've not seen the, the seismic. Yeah. The seismic part. one is, is, is pretty telling when you look at what people have done. Michael has another question. I think it's a comment about overlapping claims. Yes, I've seen the, the, there's a lot of resources in, in the disputed territories or, well, sometimes it's, it's resolute, you know, it gets resolved. Sometimes it doesn't get resolved that, that nicely. The Guyana, Venezuela border dispute. Yes, the Timor, Australian one. Yeah. Um, Stodi joint. Uh, so. Timor of, um, of northern Iran, um, but it's very extensive in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. um, seeing China claims most of the offshore, so China, Venice, China, Vietnam, China, um, Philippines. You know, so the deeper water of all those basins has been severely reduced um, and it leads to a complete hold as you quite rightly said it, it prevents any initial look any seismic shooting which prevents exploration drilling which depends appraisal which prevents development you know it, it goes all the way through the cycle um, yeah. and um, without mentioning any names my old um, chief exploration manager used to have a map of his world and he had three types of countries. Countries with good rocks, countries with um, good politics and others. <laughs> For him, it was at least as important, you know, there's certain... So that led to many countries being simply off limits. He's come to the you simply wouldn't do exploration there, even though you knew there's lots of oil, but merely that's technical oil. That has no value to the company. Unless you can produce it profitably, it might as well, you know, not be there. So, um, it, yeah, it, Michael, that's, it, a, that's a great point. You know, um, and in the real world, seeing we work for commercial companies, most of us, um, it's usually a high level filter that's put on by management that 
um, selects out which country we can enter and which one we don't. And we're seeing a massive example at the moment in asset loss in Russia to many mm -hmm. of the majors. I mean, and those assets, I think, will simply be lost and they will be written down yeah. and they will be nationalized by Gazprom. Gazprom and Rosneft, yep. So it really does matter, you know, um, this um, political viability. Um, Let me follow up on that. Actually, Michael, I have a question to you, I guess, on uh, Nash, on on these. Well, you mentioned, obviously, Gazprom may be taking over some of the, the assets within Russia. But like these, some of these companies, the, the Gazproms, but also the Chinese ones, CNPC and, and, uh, and Aramco yeah. and, and Petrobras, these companies, you know, they're, I mean, Petrobras at least partly listed, but like these companies, they're, you know, mostly nationally at least majority nationally owned, are they more aggressive in, in pursuing some of these opportunities in, in what you call sort of politically risky, but geologically good countries? And, you know, is, do you think that they, they might be, they have a higher tolerance level for, for that kind of political risks? Is that, is that how you see it? Or? <laughs> yeah, I think they do have a higher tolerance for political risk. Um, because unlike purely private companies, which have really no influence in the political sphere, um, national oil companies are a branch of the government and therefore they can act through their government to influence another government to take certain yeah. actions or not take certain actions. So that's why they have, you know, if you like a greater ability to work often with other second and third world countries. Um, and many of them, um, many of them are themselves located in second and third world countries. They are the National Oil Company of Nigeria or um, Malaysia or um, I would say Russia as well. And so they see themselves having a different, different role. And also when it comes to justification, they can say legitimately, we're not just interested in making a profit, but we're in this for the good of the people of the country we're from and the good of the people we're trying to do business with. So they, they've got a lot, they think a lot stronger hand to be able to influence things um, and so can effectively be more, you know, more aggressive. I mean, the past masters, depending on how you look at it, are the, are the Chinese globally. They are the, um, and often their deals are not purely monetary based as in a Western IOC model. Sure. So they have like these bars. So in integrated yeah. deal to the whole country and they'll build railroads and, steelworks and you know so they just see it as a part of of many other things so um and many western oil companies won't compete with that they, they just Absolutely. don't want to, you know. yeah yeah so would they do exploration as well or, or they, they, they do like oh, nexon do. is nexon is owned by scenic which is a chinese national oil company and, and both scenic and cmpc several years back stated they wanted to be more of a global player, um, which is why they are one of the partners in the Saber block with ExxonMobil and Hess through Nexon. They're, they're kind of U.S. affiliate, but um, they, they do, but typically more in exploration as a, um, as a joint interest partner, not an operator. Um, even though there's a lot of places now where they're going in and they want to operate as well. So it's, as Michael was saying, it's this establishing yourself as a, not just a national oil company, but also a true global player with your own reputation. So, but, but it's yeah. hard to compete with, yeah. And did you see that last week, there was an interesting announcement from CNUG that they're actually exiting their Western countries, uh, positions, US, UK, um, Canada, because they want to pursue this strategy of essentially third world targeting. 
Wow. They're because huge they have a strategic in advantage in that area. Yeah. And, and they um, are, I mean, we, we saw that work in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. They, they are huge in going into these areas. And you're right. They have a different economic metric um, than most, you know, international oil companies have. So they can go in at times and shoot size, make them pay money for stuff that would never make an, an economic hurdle in, in other companies. So it's, it's challenging. So it is, you know, as much as we talk about in geology, you know, we follow the rocks. We, we do as scientists, but as an explorer, you're still in here to make money. <laughs> None of us are in here to lose money. It's a real fast way to go out of business. And so you do have to understand this, all of this commercial side and the engineering and what it takes to bring these, these resources to bear. So you start with fundamentals, right? Where are the good rocks? And Michael, we used to call those countries, we called those basins arrested. So they had either a political overlay, you know, I mean, Guyana was in force majeure with both Suriname and Venezuela for 12 years. That's why nothing happened. So, you know, and now it's like, oh, how did everybody miss this? Well, people didn't miss it. You just couldn't do anything, right? Politically, financially, you really couldn't do much of anything because of that. You had to wait for that to play out. Um, it's hard to wait. Yeah, and it's interesting, even in, in, in Guyana, the northern part of the Serbra block is still in dispute. Yep, it is. And there's probably huge potential there, but it, it's in dispute with the Venezuelans. Um, and of course, we're biased that we hope Guyana gets it because Venezuela has done, quote, such a great job with the massive amount of resources that they already have that they clearly need more. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, the Guyanese, uh, I would say, on the two countries, I think, in, in the world, it's Guyana and Norway that have done a very good part on their resource management. They're probably the the best I've ever seen and worked in many countries. Um, for... Yeah, I was telling David, I think Guyana, they actually have folks from the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate that have been on their advisory boards early on. And I think that's a super smart move because you really hate to see them go the way of, of Nigeria, which would be, and, and Angola to some degree. I think Angola did a better job than Nigeria, but still a lot of corruption. So cool. Okay, do we have, so do we have other questions? We're coming up basically on our time. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I, I personally find this fascinating because we talk a lot about all this resource that's come on, that, that's that been discovered, but until you can actually get it to market, you know, it's it's basically, you know, it's, it's energy sitting in the ground. And I, I worry, that as we go through the energy transition, there will be less and less incentive um, to get some of this resource out of the ground. Now, if you're if you're a third world country or you're even not one of the OECD countries, you're going to want to utilize whatever resource you've got. Many of these these areas, I, it was interesting your GDP chart and your NPV chart. That country though has to have the economic wherewithal to bring it online. I think you had said that, or they've got to be able to get a partner that's willing to come in and do it. So without some of this political and regulatory reform you're talking about, that, that seems like that could be really hard. Are you seeing any movement in those areas, David? Especially, I mean, you're at the World Bank. A lot of people come to the World Bank for financing. Yeah, well, uh, the World Bank, uh, I, I won't comment on the bank, but like, uh, <laughs> per, like, uh, Yes, I mean, countries are, many countries that are working are, are waking up that, you know, whether this, you know, how many super cycles like this are we going to have anymore? Is it, is it the last one? Um, so, yes, there is definitely that kind of wake up call in, 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 in places. I think the, the uh, Senegal, his government was the one that put out statements uh, of this sort not, not long ago saying, you know, they see this as this big last chance and they, they really oh, yeah. maximize on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that's that's definitely uh, high high on 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 their mind, uh, and um, and also obviously the idea. The other part of the element is their own domestic energy needs, right? I mean, they, these countries um, have have been barely using any, and so they also might be skeptical to look at 
uh, you know, say the West uh, rapidly decarbonizing, which, which is great and, and needs to happen, but they, they you know, that, that doesn't mean that they want to completely, well, I mean, they don't see how they could, you know, skip um, developing, you know, their own yeah. resources and, and their own energy grids and all that. All right, well, I want to thank David for giving what was a fascinating talk. And again, this will be available um, on the HGS YouTube site where we store our technical talks. And again, if you have any follow-up questions for David, um, his contact info actually is at the HGS website as well. Go look at the seismic. I think that'd be an interesting follow-up to your, your uh, wells drill data set as well. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, appreciate this and I am going